Uh, my name is Jerry Ann Barnes, and I am the uh, chapter chair for the uh, Cleveland Heights University Heights chapter of the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland. And uh, tonight, on behalf of the uh, Greater Cleveland League, I want to welcome you here to this candidate forum. Uh, we are hearing uh, candidates from two races. Uh, the first one is um, Ohio District 9, uh, House of Representatives District 9, and the second one uh, will be for the County Council District 10. Um, the chapters that are working on this and to present this form includes, in addition to the Cleveland Heights, uh, University Heights chapter is the Cleveland League, uh, Cleveland Heights, I'm um, sorry, Cleveland chapter, uh, East Cleveland chapter, and the Shaker Heights chapter, um, all of whom have uh, some stake at, in these districts. Uh, I wanted to put out a special thank you to the city that um, is for donating the space for this uh, forum tonight. I also want to thank uh, our moderator, uh, Mary Osborne, who came all the way over from Lakewood to moderate this for us tonight. And then I want to thank our candidates for, for participating. I, I also want to point out, I suspect most people are registered to vote. Um, you, some people don't realize that, or forgot that they have moved and they need to change their address. And that also should be done before the voter registration deadline on October 9th. So if you have moved, uh, this is you, you have an opportunity. We have uh, voter registration forms out in the hallway, and, and uh, there's a volunteer there to help you complete that. Also, in addition to the voter registration, we have vote by mail applications if you want to vote by mail. And then the league uh, provides uh, an online voter guide. Oh, it's called Vote 411. This is a national website, but all of our local candidates, uh, we hope, will respond and be up there as well. And then uh, there's also a website called Judge for Yourself, which is a um, it's a website that is the ratings of I think three or four different bar associations. Um, and this sometimes can be very helpful because I know people really get stymied on voting for judges. Um, also, if you're interested in the League of Women Voters, we have a membership brochure where you can learn a little bit more about us. And if you are interested in joining, it will tell you how to join. So I think right now uh, I will thank you for coming and um, I'm going to turn this over to Mary. Everybody, and thank you for being here. Um, I want to say a couple things about about this. Um, the the candidates forums are a wonderful way for people to get to know the candidates, get to see them up close and in personal and, and, and personal. And as you know, um, a democracy uh, really rests on an informed electorate. And so, the more you know, the better you can, the better decision you can make when it comes to going to the polls. And also on behalf um, of the candidates themselves, that it is not easy to run for public office. So regardless of what side of the aisle you run or how you feel about your politics, every single person who runs for public office has a certain amount of sacrifice, a certain amount of skin in the game, and a certain amount of privacy that they sacrifice because they want to do something that's important. So, um, having said that, I'm going to go a little bit over some of the some of the uh, ground rules here. Um, each candidate will be allowed a two to three minute introductory statement. Um, the timer, who's this lady right here? Keep your eye on her. Uh, the timer will notify you of time elapsed. We ask candidates to make their statements from the table. We plan to video the forum and post the video on YouTube.com uh, with links uh, from, the, from the league website. Audience members will um, submit uh, questions on three by five cards, and they look like this, so they're not hard to spot. And they will be screened by a volunteer tier group of league members right over here, uh, not to block opinions or skew information, but to ensure all voters receive information they need in a limited amount of time. The moderator will ask the written questions, and questions can be directed to one or both candidates, and I ask anybody who is writing a question, make sure it's legible, because if I can't read it, I'm not gonna read it. 
I'm not going to try. Um, we also, uh, timekeepers, um, or our timekeeper, will raise the yellow card when the candidate has 30 seconds remaining in his or her reply. The colors are off. Pardon me? These are changed, so the colors are different. Well, that's okay. Well, they can see, if they see it's 30 seconds, they know it's time to wrap up, and, um, and if, uh, if you're confused about that, I will wrap you up. That, that's what will happen. So, we will begin. Um, somebody took my program. Uh oh. Let's get your Alright. Oh, we will begin with uh, Janine Boyd for an opening statement. Sure. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, <coughs> I'm Janine Boyd. I have the privilege of being the current state representative for Ohio House District 9. Before that, I served uh, in Cleveland Heights on city council um, for a term and a half -ish. And uh, my mom, actually, uh, the Honorable Barbara Boyd, was in the seat before me, and she was retiring and turning out. And I made the uh, difficult decision of running for her seat. And before all that, Having grown up in politics, I ran from it like it was a house on fire for a long time. <laughs> I became a speech and language pathologist. I am a bilingual speech and language pathologist by trade. Um, I studied at Hillsdale College for my undergrad, and which is a very conservative uh, school, uh, one of the most in our uh, country. And from there, I did go to law school, hated it. I went to Ohio Northern, and so I uh, changed my course and. Don't get mad. I went to Michigan State University where I received my master's in speech and language pathology. And I chose the medical uh, field. My mom used to tell me, I know you don't want to be in politics, but I'm sorry, I didn't know too much. And she was right. So when I was practicing speech pathology in the medical setting, I got very angry at the way children on public insurance were treated versus children on private insurance. There's less consistency. And uh, I tried advocating in that role didn't go very far. I was the little woman on the totem pole. And so I looked for a gig that allowed me to use my child development knowledge. And uh, everything I learned growing up, a little bit of that at law school, uh, what I've learned at what I've learned at Hillsdale, and become an advocate for children. So I did that. And I for five years had, was at uh, Head Start. I was their um, coordinator and advocate for children with special needs and mental health disorders. And from there I went to Ohio. Guidestone, which was then the Reach Children's Home and Family Services. I became their government affairs and public policy advocate. Uh, there we do everything from medically fragile foster care to workforce development for the harder to employ. I'm still there part time. I'm their federal policy director, so I read policy every day. I've become a complete policy nerd. And again, I get to legislate uh, on behalf of the communities that I grew up in, which are Cleveland Heights, Shaker Heights, University Heights and parts of Wards 2 and 4 of Cleveland. Um, I'm grateful to be here. My mom a, was a leader. She still had meetings in her living room. I know my leaders. And I'm grateful for the work that we've done together on fair districts reform and, uh, and voter registration. So thanks for having me here, and I look forward to answering any questions you have. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Miller. Yes, uh, uh, yes my name is Joe Miller. Uh, so a brief in, uh, information about me. And, uh, of course, I'm running as a Republican, just so I can uh, been married 22 years. Uh, my uh, wife works at the, at the clinic. Um, uh, I have three kids, two of them are in college. One is uh, right on the cusp of getting into college. Um, uh, I graduated uh, in this area from Model Laws uh, quite a while ago and uh, got into business. Um, I did some uh, well, before I got into business, the most important thing I did in my life, I taught basketball and I taught baseball, okay, uh, for my kids growing up. Uh, I taught Sunday school. I've been a supervisor at Chase Manhattan Mortgage uh, for a while and currently working as an account manager at EMES Supply in Eastlake. Uh, we're distributor of housekeeping goods and products. Uh, politically, um, I'm the uh, current state Republicans, uh, state central committee man for this business. What that means is that we meet four times a year in Columbus and we endorse statewide candidates and we endorse statewide issues. 
or we don't endorse statewide issues. Right. Issue one, we don't endorse. Um, I work closely with Chairman Frost here in Calvin County. Um, I also hold monthly meetings in Highland Heights on a lot of different topics and things. Anyone's invited to come, just let me know. Uh, running for state rep here in District 9, uh, this is my home. And, uh, you know, I want to make this a better place. To, I want to make this a great place to live. This should be a great place to live, including Heights, University of Shaker. Um, and, uh, um, and so that, that's, uh, I got involved in, in the politics to, um, because uh, I, I really want to make a difference in this area. And uh, there's two items that I'll be uh, focusing on a little bit tonight, and one is going to be on property taxes, and the other is going to be on uh, school choice. And to me, those are two very crucial, huge issues that we can really, uh, uh, if we do it right, we can make a huge impact on this area. And uh, again, uh, I want to thank, uh, thank everybody in the League of uh, Women Voters for uh, allowing me to be here tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Um, we have our first question, and this is directed to um, to Ms. Boyd. Please discuss your position, and actually both, both candidates will have an opportunity to answer. Please discuss your position on protecting the rights of lesbian, gay, trans and transgender, bisexual, and queer citizens. Thank you for that question. I am 1,000% in favor of protecting the rights of every member of our community, including members of the LGBTQ community. Um, I was part uh, with Cleveland Heights City Council person at the time, Cheryl Stevens, of creating, of advancing our Cleveland Heights um, protection and policy uh, when I was on city council. I am fighting currently in the state house against some really terribly destructive bills that are coming through. I'm, I, have, I have the privilege of serving as ranking minority member on a committee called Community and Family Advancement. And it also, on that committee with me, are some of the most conservative members of the Ohio House. And it is their intention to uh, make it very difficult for members of the LGBTQ community to, to have protections of any kind. Um, and to even feel welcome. One of the bills, Representative Vitale pushed out of the House, uh, same day my bill passed out of the House, and the kinship care bill, um, and not without us fighting it, but it passed, was uh, one that provides that religious entities that also have venues that they rent to the public, okay, so a church, a synagogue, a temple, they also have venues that they rent to the public can now turn away members of the LGBTQ community. They don't have to rent to them. So that is legislating dis discrimination, and I am uh, never in favor of legislative discrimination of any kind. Thank you. Mr. Miller. Okay. I, uh yeah, let, let me just address that issue. Okay, let's address the issue. Uh, uh, first of all, it, I'm a little surprised if it, we have to put in some kind of uh, legislation or something, particularly just for one class of people. I think we've got plenty of that uh, already. Uh, and I don't really quite understand um, exactly what is going to take place uh, with the legislation to protect them. Maybe somebody can explain it to me. But I know that in uh, county council, they voted eight to three just recently for the county now, uh, passed an ordinance uh, that you cannot discriminate against uh, LGBTQ people uh, in the workforce. And uh, so to me it's so ludicrous because first of all, if you hire somebody, you don't, no one puts on there that they're uh, gay or homosexual or anything like that. How do you know, first of all, that you're hiring someone like that, and then if they're if they're not, uh, so you're hiring them and you don't know what their orientation is. So then you fire them, and it could be a lawsuit. That's what this whole discrimination thing is about. It could be a lawsuit. It's like well, they're not doing their job. So uh, uh, to me, I don't quite understand the whole uh, 
whole LGBTQ uh, um, situation there. Uh, I think there's uh, plenty of protection for all of us. Nobody likes racism, discrimination, or anything. But um, you just can't. Why are we singling out a specific group of people and we're going to give them, uh, you know, uh, greater rights than anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Next question, um, and this is for Mr. Miller. We'll start with you. Are you in favor or opposed to issue one? Absolutely opposed to issue one. Absolutely, 100% opposed to issue one. That was. If you know what issue one is, um, it's not all that it was uh, cracked up to be in a certain sense. Uh, what issue one does is you can have in your possession uh, narcotics, which formerly would be an F5 felony, which is six months to a year. You can have that on, uh, on your uh, possession, and it's a warning. You get a warning. That's what issue one is. And then you can get stopped by the police, uh, and it's a warning the second time. And it's only after the third time, uh, within two years, that you would uh, actually see any jail time. So the whole idea is it's preponderance. Um, if you read the bill, it makes no sense. I strongly encourage you to uh, look into that. Uh, it is interesting. I, well, first of all, it's funded by George Soros and Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, that's common knowledge. They spent four and a half million dollars to fund that, to get people out there to get signatures, put it on the ballot. Um, so this is not an Ohio issue at all. Um, you know, it's, but it's something they want to kind of, uh, they've been very devious about it too. They've been saying, well, it's just in case you get caught a little bit of marijuana or something like that, uh, you're not going to go to jail. Uh, you can have a, a very large amounts. Like I said, it's an F5 felony. Uh, you have that much on you, um, and it's nothing. So, that, you know, drug dealers, drugs, are going to come into uh, Ohio because of this. So, uh, and I just want to also, since we're uh, educating everybody, that uh, you know we have a governor's race as well, and uh, uh, Mike DeWine is totally against it, 100% against it, and uh, Richard Corderoy is 100% uh, in favor of it. And I, I just ask you, you know, what do you think is best for Ohio? Thank you. Um, Ms. Boyd? Sure. I am 100% endorsing issue one. Uh, I am the treasurer with the Ohio Legislative Black Caucus. We had a press conference yesterday in which our uh, caucus endorsed issue one. I'm going to tell you what issue one does. Issue one, and may I also say, criminal justice reform is an Ohio issue. Criminal justice reform is an Ohio issue. It's an issue everywhere. It reduces sentences for certain crimes, and it's a ballot initiative, it's not a bill. It reduces sentences for certain crimes for inmates in state institutions by up to 25% if they participate in approved rehabilitative work and educational programs. It reclassifies certain non-serious, non-violent drug offenses to misdemeanors. It requires the development of graduated responses or sliding scales for non-criminal probation violations such as missing work. People go to jail for that. Yes. It requires a calculation of the savings resulting from reductions in the number of incarcerated days and to redirects that money through state appropriations as follows. 70% of the savings for substance abuse treatment programs. The remaining 30% for crime victim programs, including victim trauma recovery. Funding for probation programs and criminal justice rehabilitation programs, some of our most strapped programs, but not as fit, what is not strapped are privatized prisons. They have revenue that's generated from recidivism. Inmates mean dollar signs. So certainly the party that has been behind privatizing the prisons is not interested in decreasing the number of persons in those prisons because that's profit. So I am 100% in favor of issue one. Thank you. Um, we'll start uh, this next round of questions with Ms. Boyd. Uh, what would you do to make Ohio's economy grow faster? It's a good question. So many things. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so I have a, uh, I've done a lot of work in statewide workforce development policy. 
uh, again, for the harder to employ uh, primarily. So those are the returning veterans who might be dealing with mental health, health issues and medication management, um, or additional supports, single parents who might need additional supports, um, seniors who have found that they can, uh, cannot live in retirement and have to find new skill sets and new uh, job markets. Um, we leave those, a lot of those people out, right? And returning, you know, re-entry folks, right? People coming out of the prison system. We leave a lot of them out. You know, we, we, we create um, an economy that, that leaves a lot of them out and they, they still have vital uh, skills that we could use. And, and that too would create, a, that would contribute to our economy. Um, I'm interested in um, the environmental and friendly ways of increasing our economy. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in, um, oh, gosh, that's such a big question. I have so many ideas. <laughs> so I, uh, um, so many, there's so many things I wrote down earlier. I have so many notes. But I, so, um, oh, here, that's what I answered on the leak questions. So, uh, for instance, in terms of the environment, the question you guys asked me. Oh, so there's this, there was this Clean Ohio Revitalization Fund, I'll try to be quick, um, and it was designed as a grant program to incentivize brownfields redevelopment, Cheryl sure, probably remembers it, and it reduces blight, maximizes site marketability, protects human health and the environment, creates jobs and benefits Ohio's economy. Ohio was actually voted to renew it in 2008, um, but Governor Casey got rid of it when he did Jobs Ohio. He made it a loan program, so less communities went after it because it's a loan you have to pay back instead of a grant that you earn because of your proposal uh, and your need. So I would like to legislatively return Thank that. Thank you very much. Yes. That's oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> I never got to that. Um, Mr. Miller. <laughs> okay. uh, I have a couple ideas of some jobs uh, on job growth here no, you know, in the area. Um, first of all, uh, the lakefront, we have that uh, we have that lake out there, maybe you've seen it, Lake called Lake Erie, uh, beautiful. Uh, it's the greatest uh, freshwater lake there is, and we do nothing with it. Uh, maybe we could, uh, we could get a beach, you know, you can even make the beaches, by the way. Uh, I was out in uh, North Carolina on vacation, and they actually widened, if you've been out of the Outer Banks, they, they widened that beach 150 feet just by having a tanker out there pumping uh, sand up. But there's, there's, we need creativity, okay? We need creativity in this area, and we don't have it. We have no creativity for creating jobs. Uh, we have a medical market convention center, and that thing is underground, by the way. And do we use it? I mean, do we use it? Has, any, has anybody gone to it? It's not like a billion dollars in our, our taxes uh, to put that thing up. Uh, the Fortune 100 companies, I think we have two left, maybe. Where did they all go? Why are they leaving? Uh, in the 70s and 80s, we had, we had a thriving, much better thriving economy. BP left. BP left, but they left the building. Figure that one out. So what's going on here? Uh, what's, what is the problem here in this area? Taxes are killing us. Taxes are killing us. And then what are some of the other complaints? Well, it's violent. You know, there's a violent area, Cleveland's violent, it's ugly, it's, you know, it's, uh, uh, so, um, you know, we've got to get away from that, uh, that. So, uh, you know, as far as job creation, um, we've got to lower taxes, which we do a lot. Uh, let's get the school choice going. And let's get some, uh, you know, some really strong leadership. Uh, I think somebody was asking uh, Frank Jackson, uh, about uh, development in Cleveland in the area and stuff, and he said, "Well, that's not my job as mayor. It's everybody's job, and we need strong we need strong people to be able to uh, to have a vision." And I think we like that. Thank you. Uh, this next question will start with you, Mr. Miller. The local government funds have been cut over the years by Ohio's government. What policies would you advocate to help local governments? Please say that one The local government funds have been cut over the years by Ohio state government. What policies would you advocate to help local governments? Um, that's a good question. Uh, my, uh, my general answer to um, uh, what we have to accomplish is um, 
uh, we have to rein in uh, spending. And it's usually not an issue of not receiving enough money. It's usually a, an issue of, uh, of uh, wasting the money. And that's, that's really what we got to get to. And uh, I know a lot of that is the, that is the core number one issue. Uh, Cleveland Heights, any of these areas. Uh, you know, we've got to rein in the, rein in this, uh, the spending. Uh, now, you know, if you look at Cleveland Heights, we have water and sewer rates that cost more than uh, a new automobile. And for the longest time, you know, I don't want to just pick up the but I'm just bringing up a point. For the longest time, we had water that was just uh, um, main water breaks underneath the city, just water gushing out. Um, that was never fixed. Uh, there's a lot of ways uh, we can cut the spending and, uh, and be just as efficient. So I don't think it's always just a case of, well, we got to get more money. You know, that's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a crybaby mentality, you know. It, where is the real leadership? And let's get transparency in the, in the government, too. Let's get transparency uh, in local, local cities and that so we can see what, what's really happening with the money. And um, we, can make some, we can make some improvements in that. That's where it's at, though. All right? It's not just, gee whiz, gosh, jolly, why don't we get more money? It's like, what are you doing with the money? And there is no shortage of, uh, uh, of waste. Not just local cities, but in the county or the government. So. Thank you. Um, Ms. Boyd. So I want to start by saying the Global Government Fund was a bipartisan creation. Uh, I'm not sure which year it was. It's before my time. Um, but it was a bipartisan creation. And along with other uh, tax revenue streams, uh, this administration has eliminated significantly those dollars that benefited local governments and local communities. Um, when we talk about businesses leaving, you know, businesses are not just about tax incentives. They're about, you know, neighborhoods that are strong. They're about um, public transportation, shared transportation. My colleagues in the, on the other side of the aisle have not have chosen not to increase funding to public transportation. Instead, they created a statewide um, study committee to see how what the needs are in terms of public transportation. Some of them serve more than one county in their district. It might be even harder for their constituents to get to where they need to go. But we're talking about treatment and mental health, work, work training, school, etc. Um, these are the kinds of things that also attract businesses and, want, and incur and, and uh, motivate them to stay. Um, my colleagues in the last biennial budget, operational budget, decided to restore some of the government fund dollars. Again. There's another example of legislating disparity. They restored over $34 million of local government funds to villages of 1,000 residents or less and townships. They took the shares that belonged to suburbs and cities and created statewide competitive grants for police training. Let me say that again. They took the shares that belonged for, to everybody from Westlake to Garfield Heights. Cleveland Heights to Cincinnati. They took those shares and created a statewide competitive grant program to train police. But they did see it fit to restore some of that money to the places where many of them live. Thank you. Okay, this question will begin again with you, uh, Ms. Boyd. How can urban interests be better represented in the Ohio House? Well, <laughs> the best way for me to uh, answer that as a member of the urban community, you know, we're considered an urban suburb, like Cleveland Heights, Shaper Heights, University Heights. Um, we need more balance. We need, uh, you know, right now it's 66 Republicans, 33 Democrats in the House. There's no balance there. Um, we have to, when there's more balance, there's more opportunity to learn from each other. You know, we need each other when there's balance. We have to talk to each other about our policies. Otherwise, what you see is what happens right now. A lot of our legislators legislate in a vacuum, right? They, they, don't, they don't realize the connection between the bill they're doing over here in Ways and Means and how it'll affect the bill that's coming out of education community. 
and where it affects people is in their lives. So you have bills that even counter each other. And, you know, if we had more balance, if we had a more balanced house that looks like, that would look like the state of Ohio. The state of Ohio is predominantly split. Uh, it's almost 50-50 when it comes to conservative or progressive uh, policy interests. So if there were more balance, we would need each other. We would talk more and we could create more balanced uh, policy. Not everybody knows how to do that. I'm very fortunate having attended Hillsdale College and having watched my mother do this work and a lot of uh, the people that she mentored do this work. And so I know uh, most of my bills are actually bipartisan. The one I just passed unanimously out of the House, fully funded at $5 million for kinship care, bipartisan. So there is a way to do it, but because people don't come in necessarily knowing how to do it, the atmosphere, if it were more balanced, it would, I think, uh, inspire that. Thank you. Mr. Miller. Sorry, guys. Could you just run through that question one more time? Oh, sure. Uh, how can urban interests be better represented in the Ohio House? Um, okay, I get to that. I, I just want to uh, uh, hit on one thing that uh, Janine said about uh, public transportation. Just get that for a second. I'll get to your question. Um, RTA wants to increase uh, the sales tax, um, and we're, we're talking about how important. Uh, I'll get back to RTA in a second. I'll get to you. I probably made it better off answering the question. Okay. Well, I, I, there's a couple issues that I'm really important, I think, would benefit this area. One is school choice. Let me just see how that can work with uh, the urban area, Cleveland <coughs> Heights, uh, because it encompasses a lot. It encompasses property taxes that are just out insane right now. And uh, it also gives, um, it gives the parents and the kids, it gives them uh, the power, the power to make the choices. Uh, what we could do is uh, we could have a universal voucher system. We could get bipartisan support in, this, in the state house, hopefully. And we could, um, we could open up uh, technology schools, we could open up vocational schools, we could open up a lot of opportunities for kids that graduate from uh, high school instead of just college which uh, today the president of the is, is probably not the best alternative for most kids anyhow. Uh, but I see that as an opportunity because if we can use a voucher system, they do it in Sweden, by the way. Let me just say this real quick. In Sweden, a very liberal, uh, progressive uh, country, they have a voucher system for schools, and the, but the really neat thing about it is um, you're allowed to go to religious school, you're allowed to go private, you're allowed to go public, you're allowed to go uh, you know, whatever you want. So it's money for you uh, to use, and this benefits mom and dad, this benefits the kid, this benefits society, this benefits the taxpayer. Thank you very much, Mr. Miller. Um, I'm gonna direct this next question to you, and it's actually a two-part question. Um, <coughs> drinking water is said to be the quote-unquote oil of the future. Do you agree? And if so, how do we in Ohio need to prepare, and what can we do to better protect Lake Erie? Okay, well, I think well, as far as uh, Lake Erie has been getting cleaner and cleaner, and I think the policies that are there right now are, are probably doing a pretty good job. And there's quite a few uh, legislation out there. Uh, I think that Lake, Lake Erie is, uh, if you've been out there and fishing or anything, it's a clean lake. You know, it's a, it's a wonderful, beautiful lake. Um, when you just get the commercial fishermen out of there, we can start catching and purging them. But, um, uh, water, clean water, yes, clean water is important. Uh, we have it, we have an overabundance of it, we have a lake right there. Um, I don't see, uh, I don't see an, an obstacle here uh, to clean water. It's, uh, I, I don't see that, that as an obstacle. I'm, I'm more concerned with uh, the water bill that we have to pay. I'm more concerned with the uh, sewer rates that we have to pay. But as far as clean water, I, I, uh, I, don't, I don't think there is an issue with that. You can create one, but I don't honestly think that we have an issue with clean water here in this area. We shouldn't with the lake right there. 
But uh, what might be a, a really interesting question if we have time is to get into uh, Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, the rates they've been hitting us with, uh, the clue of water, uh, the rates here in the clue of heights, and, and topics like that, because that's hitting us right now, directly today. Um, so uh, maybe we'll touch on that. Honestly, I don't think, um, I think the laws we have in effect right now are satisfactory for it. Thank you, Ms. Boyd. So, first of all, um, I was going to say this, my mom always told me the foolishness rolls downhill. So at the federal level, uh, under this administration, just so you know, the uh, protections for ocean water have been repealed. And uh, the sorts of protections that were in place in terms of uh, offshore drilling have been repealed. So the, the opportunity for more oil spills and destruction that way uh, and, uh, you know, just the opportunities for higher levels of pollution when it comes to our large bodies of water are now present. Those opportunities now exist. That's one. At the state level, there has been some good bipartisan legislation dealing with the algae blooms, dealing with um, farmers and how they uh, dispel waste and not using the waters uh, to do that. Um, that there's been some good bipartisan policy on that. Rep. Sheehy, uh, Toledo has been at the uh, forefront of that. Um, but we still have fracking, right? And the thing about fracking that people don't understand is we, we've always used fracking, but we use water. Now there's some insane hundreds of pounds of chemicals that we include in the water to do the actual fracking. And that is what's getting into our earth and our water. So uh, while we have done some good things at the state level, the federal level is something we have to uh, keep watching because like my mom always said, foolishness rolls downhill. And then we need to do, we really need to be more, uh, we need to play a more conscious, legislative, activist role about the use of chemicals and fracking. Thank you. Uh, this next question will begin with uh, Ms. Boyd. Please tell us your position on current Ohio gun laws. Oh, good Lord, yes. So, um, I, so I am a Moms Demand Action member. Um, I, my stepdaughter to be is a member of Students Demand, and I have two uh, common sense, responsible gun owner policy proposals. Uh, I, I do not want to take anyone's right to bear arms away, but I do think that this has all gotten a little crazy and out of hand and uh, absurd. You know, when we get to a place of, at the federal level, talking about making it easier to purchase silencers or allowing 3D, the, the at home manufacturing of 3D plastic guns off your computer, you know, that can't be uh, detected by metal detectors, then we've really, I think, we've gone off the deep end. So, two of my, gun, my two gun proposals, just so you're aware of them, one of them is the uh, Domestic Violence Victim Protection Act, which I have the privilege of, uh, I've had the privilege of introducing with Rep. Nikki Antonio in our sister city, her city, mm -hmm. Lakewood. Uh, and that is a gun relinquishment bill. It is a temporary gun relinquishment as prescribed by law enforcement and the courts and when a protection order has been issued because that is the most dangerous time, the 24 hours around the time of a, a protection order being issued is the most dangerous time and it ends in the most uh, domestic uh, fatal shootings in the country. That's where the highest amount of domestic fatalities occurs by Chicago. So that one, and then the other one is, you know, I have uh, a lot of pro-gun enthusiast colleagues, and they say things to me, they compare guns to cars. So my other proposal is that when a person purchases a firearm, at the time of purchase, purchasing it, no matter where they purchase it in Ohio, whether it's online or even at a private uh, sale with a person who's not licensed to sell, uh, they have to present with qualified liability insurance of up to $250,000 in order to purchase that firearm. So I am pro-constitution, 
but I am also pro right for everyone to live free of gun violence. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Miller. Okay. Well, thank God it's not going to become law. I hope. Uh, let's just get the record straight here because uh, there's a lot of bad publicity about guns. Okay. Yes, they kill people, obviously. Um, let's just look at a couple things. First of all, Americans want guns. Okay. Um, I think 1982, California put out a, uh, on the ballot that they wanted to ban guns. It was defeated so badly that no state has even attempted it since. Americans want guns. And what we have to do, if we're going to do any kind of gun legislation, you got to figure out a way to get the guns into good people's hands and take them out of bad people's hands. And any kind of legislation uh, that I've seen just really punishes uh, the good people. What I would be in favor of is some universal state laws. I, I uh, cringe in the fact that you might be able to have a law in different cities with gun laws. Uh, that would really um, confuse things. Also, as far as testing goes, you know, if you want to get a, a concealed carry permit, you have to go through testing. You have to uh, come up with uh, 100, 200 rounds of shooting. You, know, you have to show that you're um, competent with the gun. You can clean it. You know, they show you uh, safety measures with it. To me, that's the most important thing, safety measures uh, with the gun. Uh, now, there, are ex there, there can be some domestic violence and things like that, uh, but for the, for the most part, uh, we don't want to be taking the Second Amendment away from uh, good citizens under any circumstance, certainly not $250,000 liability, which is insane. And let me just say one other thing here. Uh, it was just in the paper a couple days ago, Brazil, the president, He's the front runner right now for uh, for Brazil. His name is uh, Bolsonaro, and uh, in Brazil they don't have guns; they outlaw the guns. Uh, his platform right now is that he wants to put guns in good people's hands because he says that's what it takes to make Brazil safe again. And Brazil has gone crazy with violence. They don't have guns, and they've gone crazy with violence. Well, we can talk about more, but I think, I think the time is. Thank you. Um, uh, let's start with Mr. Miller. Are you in favor of um, an effort to expand Medicaid in Ohio? Um, well, I think it's already been expanded. So uh, uh, I guess uh, it's it's okay. I mean, I guess I'm, I guess I'm for it. Um, you know, Governor Kasich expanded Medicaid uh, with the hope that it would reach another 250,000 people maximum, and it's uh, gone to 700,000 already, so it's just, it's just eating up the uh, state budget. Um, so, being in favor of it, yes, uh, that's fine, but you know, just to put a little um, context in this whole thing, like, like I said, that's, it's a third of the budget, Medicaid, Medicaid, uh, Medicaid, Medicaid expansion. Uh, you only have so many tax. You only have so much money. So if you're going to be, you know, if we're going to go that route, I would say at the very least you have to put some kind of work requirement on people um, because uh, it, it, there has to be something. You have to do something to help enhance the community. Um, the other thing too, though, with uh, with Medicaid expansion. Maybe people don't, aren't aware of this. It does help to fund Planned Parenthood, which is something I'm not exactly thrilled about. And uh, it does lead to, we, we always talk about this opiate crisis. It does help uh, with the opiate crisis because uh, people are able to get drugs uh, more easier, more hospital visits. And uh, research has shown that. Um, it was last year 39% increase in opiate deaths since many uh, in the Medicaid expansion. And Wisconsin does not have Medicaid expansion, a 2% increase in opiate deaths. So there is, uh, you know, there is some bad with it as well. It's just, it's not just all of the blood done. Thank you, Ms. Boyd. So, okay, there's, there's no direct correlation between Medicaid expansion and that's first of all, Medicaid is federal money, not state money. It comes from the feds. Um, additionally, uh, 
you heard me say earlier that sometimes legislation will develop in one committee and, and end up countering legislation that's developed in another committee. This happens more frequently than you could probably imagine. And um, you know, the majority of people on Medicaid, period, are children, seniors, uh, and uh, women. So, uh, and people with disabilities. So that's the majority of people on Medicaid, just so you know. And uh, when we talk to the advocacy organization, and I am pro-Medicaid, pro-Medicaid expansion, and pro-Medicare. I absolutely 1,000% that the government by the people, for the people, of the people, has responsibility to help the people if they cannot afford uh, good health insurance, decent health insurance, and they're working, and they're going to school, or they hit a hard patch, and they have an illness that it completely wipes them out, or uh, the financially, or they, et cetera. So, and, um, yes, so I'm pro that, that was the actual question. But I just uh, wanted to address the points that were made so that you are aware of them. And the, the correlation that the, the advocacy organizations around addiction, the addiction crisis that's been happening in our state for generations, it just happens to be opioids now, but we've had generations of an addiction crisis. And I would say that our government for the past 20, 30 years in the state of Ohio is it in part responsible because we haven't even increased Medicaid reimbursement rates for addiction or mental health treatment in over 20 years. And now we're going to uh, managed care, which is gonna put even more stringent caps on addiction and mental health treatment. So we are, as a government, part responsible. Thank you. Um, and this, this question will begin with Ms. Boyd. The RTA appears to be in trouble. How can the Ohio State Legislature help? By funding public transportation at least to the levels that our neighboring states fund theirs. Shared transportation helps the environment. It, it creates jobs. Uh, there is absolutely, it, it is the thing that gets people to work. People talk about, you know, the brain, the, what do they call it, brain drain, where young people leave uh, for other communities instead of staying uh, here when they graduate from college or graduate school. Uh, this is why, in part, they like the idea of taking public transportation. I don't even want to go back to the fact that the governor went in his first term and we, we were eligible for that transportation funding, that train money. And he sent it back. Now, I'm not going to go that far back. I'm going to leave that there. But the point is, as a state, we need to value public transportation. We need to value it. And I said this earlier. I just, I cannot, I want to have my conversations with my peers, and we talk about the fact that they are districts that, unlike, you know, our district is very unique. The communities all touch each other. That's not how it is across the state. There are districts that are, have two or three counties in them, and they're very expensive. And so if you don't have public transportation, how are you getting to addiction treatment services? How are you getting to your social worker? How are you getting to your job training class? How are you getting to your new job? It's, it, it, it blows my mind. It blows my mind, but again, countering, countering. You can't say you're gonna do all these tax incentives for businesses to stay, but then you don't provide things like public transportation uh, as for the employees that will be attracted uh, to, uh, that will need, uh, the employees of those businesses that will need to get to work, and not everyone can afford a car. So. That's the answer. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Miller. Uh, well, I hate to rain on anybody's parade, but, okay. Um, yeah, I kind of feel a little bit uh, different than uh, Virginia. Um, we look at RTA right now, it's a mess. It's a mess and they want more money. They already get 1% of our sales tax. A lot of people here know that. 1% of our sales tax goes directly to RTA. That is twice the amount of Cincinnati and twice the amount of Columbus. They've got money, and I said this before, it's not a matter of not having money, it's, man it's a matter of mismanagement of funds. And the other point too, that everybody's using our team, it's not the case. They, they, are, they lose so much money every year, okay? Uh, people don't use RTA because RTA was developed to get you downtown when everybody worked downtown, and people don't work downtown like they used to work downtown. So it's, uh, it's not working. 
all right? And if something's not working, it's time to like, let's make some changes, you know? Uh, they need the money, they've got a, they, they're very good at it. They've got salaries and pensions and everything else that they have to take care of, and they've got to get new buses. And if the, it's just not used. A lot of communities don't want RTA going through their communities either, okay? They really don't. Um, so, uh, what can we do? Well, first of all, we're giving them 1% of the sales tax. I think they have to make do with it. Now, I was, uh, just so to put the record straight, because as strong as she feels for it, I, strong, I feel that strongly against it. I was working with a group to, uh, RTA was thinking about adding uh, to the sales tax. And uh, I worked with a group, and we raised holy uh, heck. Uh, and hopefully that was part of the reason why they decided to put it off. But it's not going to be long, they're going to try to hit us on a ballot initiative to, uh, to increase the sales tax. No way. Okay? Okay? No way uh, can we allow that to happen. They got plenty. Uh, they have plenty of money. Uh, we can look at other uh, ways of uh, helping with transportation. Um, uh, maybe Uber uh, for people that. Oh, here's one other thing too. It's it's totally impractical. You can't get to a store. Thank you very much, you know, uh, Mr. Miller. You know, um, we'll go to the next question. We'll begin with you. Um, how are we preparing for the transfer to carbon neutral energy? diversify their uh, power sources. 
Um, I, of course, am for diversifying our power sources. We know there's all studies show that coal and natural gas, uh, the pollution they emit, they can cause medical issues, neurological, breathing, all that stuff. Uh, and it's just, it's not good for us. Um, again, we, we talked about fracking, that there was a safer way to do it at one time. We have moved from that so that we could get more faster, uh, which isn't always good for the earth, for us, for the environment. Um, and uh, yeah, but at this point, you know, aside from some of the, like I mentioned, the bipartisan bills that are working to protect the waters and, um, you know, uh, and us fighting to, our caucus really trying to fight to unfreeze the standards and get those moving again and in place for the utility companies to uh, have to live up to. We, we really, we're kind of uh, frozen right now. Okay, now this will be the last question for, um, for these candidates. Um, we, it, and it's a two-part question, it's from two people. Um, our state, with regard to child care, our state, uh, how can our state help parents find good child care for preschoolers, perhaps offer incentives to families? And then what can we do to get most Ohio kids in preschool? Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Boy. Okay. So, I said to you earlier that I did government affairs for children with special needs and mental health disorders for Head Start. Head Start is an incredible uh, preschool program. I'm still a fan. Uh, so, the first thing about childcare, and so you, it depends on who you're talking about. So, I just did a kinship care bill, right? Because one of the ways to keep kids out of foster care is to keep them with their family members. Uh, if a family is in crisis and those children have to be removed from their immediate parents or guardians. Uh, kinship care provides that. It's grandma, it's grandpa, it's aunt, it's uncle. So if we're talking about you know finding childcare that, and, and qualifying financially for vouchers from uh, your uh, county administration of children and families, you know we, it depends on those kinds of things. What is the what kind of income are we talking about? We're talking about if you're on social security and retirement. We're talking about if you're uh, currently employed. What sort of benefit the child might be getting, and if you're Kinship care placement, for instance, is formalized. So there's all kinds of very there's all kinds of variables that help that kind of influence how you find childcare, if that makes sense, and what childcare uh, is you know would be best for your child. Um, there's also step up to quality, which actually I helped create locally first at the Office of the Best in Children starting point back in the day when I was at Head Start, and that is. Um, it's, uh, so child cares can go after grants, and every time they, so every time they uh, improve their curriculum, their activities, uh, there's different criteria, uh, they have to match, they get raised a star, and they get grant money, higher grant money to do more. Um, so there's a website for Step Up to Quality. If you Google Step Up to Quality, um, or if you need more information, I'm happy to get it to you. Uh, but there's, you can find, Three, four star rated uh, child Thank teams. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Miller. Yeah. Okay, I'm, um, I guess I'm not really up on all this um, uh, agency stuff that she's referring to. I'm sure that's all good. I would say, though, that we could simplify things a little bit. Uh, what I was talking about before, which is maybe a universal voucher system. You know, and then you can, you have the money, well, you can go to the daycare center you want to go to, you can go to the kindergarten you want to go to. Uh, and we keep it simple. Uh, there's not all this uh, bureaucratic paperwork and everything that has to be involved in being able to generate, you know, better schools. Uh, and, and as a parent, you have a choice. There. So, uh, you know, that, that is the most important thing. If you know, the kid, uh, you know, pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, those are the most important years so, uh, but let's make it simple, you know, uh, we can't complicate things. I, I would love to see the universal voucher system for schools, um, that gives everybody a playing field, uh, a good playing field, and it kind of, um, it takes a monopoly away from the public school system, so it gives the power back to our parents and the kids, and we could, we could, you know, use that even at the kindergarten level, preschool level and stuff like that, so, uh, 
So that would be one way I would look at it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for being here and uh, participating and answering our questions. And we're going to take a five-minute break, and um, the next candidate will be uh, Cheryl Stevens, who's running on the post, but she will be happy to entertain questions when the time comes. And so I think it's 
probably appropriate to have every elected official and every staff person at a senior level participate in some ethics education classes every year. I know the state recommends it, but not everybody does it. And I would say that that's something we need to agree to do. Um, refreshers on our ethics so that we don't forget. Um, one of the things I think that uh, we can do better on is our commitment to housing and economic development. That's my personal specialty. And I'd like to see us be much more aggressive in that because that means we'll be more financially sound as a region. And we have to find, we can't just follow our old precedents. We need to find new and creative ways to um, create jobs, to house people, and to, go, to nurture our children so that we have a better future. <coughs> Thank you. Um, the next question is, this is moving right along here. Um, how do we encourage more people to move here? Well, that's when we begin to think outside the box. We can't just use the old answers. Um, some of the old answers are it's cheaper to live here. Uh, I know that um, my house in Southern California, where my father resides today, is a million dollar home. It's in Forest Hill, and um, it's nice, it's a colonial, uh, but it's not a million dollars, and I didn't think that house in Pasadena was a million dollars. <coughs> That's a different market. Um, our, uh, we have some great higher educational opportunities in our region. There's uh, John Carroll, there's Case, there's Cleveland State, there's Baldwin Wallace, and there's, of course, for, if you move southern, further south in the state, there's the Ohio State and University of Dayton. Um, we have Denison, and so we have great higher levels of higher education. Um, so I think those are things that are attractive about our state, but we have not figured out our future. Uh, we, uh, there's that old Rust Belt phrase, we need to find our new selves. Um, uh, California had traditionally been known for, you we know, went to California to become a movie star. Um, but now we know that technology is part of their base, it's some company and um, in, in, in the investment that is created by the wealth in the state um, is, but makes, California more attractive, so they have a million people immigrate to California from the balance of the, the states, the other 49 states every year. We've got to figure out what makes us more attractive than any other state and, <coughs> and begin to invest in that type of development. My suspicions are it should have something to do with medicine since the Cleveland Clinic's name is respected more globally. Um, and University Hospital is not too shabby itself. So why don't we take a look at doing what they're doing? And we've, got, we've had some initiatives on it, but we haven't been as aggressive as they have in the corner around the, the Mayo Clinic. If we can do that kinds of, kind of activity, we can begin to change because Cleveland Clinic is one of the top three employers in the state of Ohio with its multiple facilities. Um, off the top of my head, that's where we should go. Okay, thank you. Um, and what are the three <coughs> biggest issues facing Cuyahoga County, do you think? Education is number one. Uh, we had too many school districts that received D's and F's when it came to the report card. Um, number two, I think that uh, we have uh, issues related to um, uh, the safety net for um, families in, in poverty, because our incomes are not going up, they're going down. And uh, thirdly, we need to figure out where our job growth will be at, reference to the question you asked me previously. Okay. Um, recently, county government has been criticized about spending practices. Please comment on this. <clears throat> well, um, our, our change to a uh, council form of government uh, the charter created co-equal branches of government. Uh, if you take a look at that document, which isn't actually too long or too hard to read, uh, and I read it several times when it was originally created, and of course this year I um, printed out multiple copies from my PC. Uh, it says that the county exec and county council are to work together for the improvement of the county. In some ways, in trying to work with the county exec council has let the county exec, now our second county exec, 
take the leadership role on almost everything. And maybe what we should do is have a more collaborative engagement between the county exec and county council. Um, and so that way we understand more aggressively what's needed to make the changes to be financially stronger in Cuyahoga County and to be able to take care of more of our residents better. Okay, thank you. Uh, what can county government do to help Lake Erie and the environment? Well, um, we have probably uh, 50 <coughs> to 60 miles of uh, lake shore uh, at the northern end of Cuyahoga County. That's our northern border. Um, we need to work with state government, and we have um, regular, on a regular basis about how we manage the flow of water into uh, Lake Erie from the Cuyahoga River. Uh, we have uh, water and waste management ideas about how to aggressively uh, make sure that we don't put too much debris or uh, one of the concerns with the Cuyahoga River was the, the sludge that, and um, uh, uh, sand and uh, other materials that go into the river and then come out into the lake. We've been pretty aggressive in pulling those materials out and finding adaptive reuses for, for them. In my, um, pre, uh, I used to work for the Cuyahoga Land Bank, and we would take uh, uh, dredged uh, materials out and use them to fill in uh, some of the holes, especially in commercial properties where we didn't have residential uses, so that we could make sure that, uh, that it was a low cost and um, it was an uh, aggressive way to recycle dredged, uh, and dredged materials from the river. So it is entirely appropriate for us to do partnerships with um, uh, Ohio EPA, US EPA, and the Army Corps of Engineers to be aggressive about energy conservation, about uh, sustainability and reuse. In fact, I'm quite proud of a relationship that I've developed with um, Motor Cars Honda on Mayfield. They now have a zero carbon footprint because they created they um, are using solar panels to create energy for their um, automobile dealership. And if we had more um, business owners and owners of large residential apartment buildings, they could put um, these uh, solar panels on their roofs and create energy in a clean, more efficient way. Um, occasionally, during the winter, you still have to use energy, but they would have uh, created enough savings um, and sold enough solar to our general electric providers so that they, in essence, create not only a zero carbon footprint for themselves, but can do it for surrounding properties as well. Thank you. Um, okay, this next question is, I'm sure, one that everybody here is wondering about. What should we do with the Justice Center? Well, I think that we may need to implode it and rebuild it. <laughs> uh, the, if you have been in the Justice Center, you know that it needs major work. And I don't know that a rehab um, would be um, as efficient as new construction. So at a minimum, we're going to have to look at transitioning the courts um, and uh, the support staff for the Justice Center to a facility on an interim basis while we re rebuild the site. Um, a centrally located um, facility is incredibly important for um, attorneys downtown, for people who are um, in needing to go to the courts either because they um, have cases before the courts or are wanting to listen and watch. All the kinds of reasons you end up in um, the building where the courts are and the judicial system is active, um, it needs to be centrally located. The one problem I have with the, the Justice Center as it exists now is that there's, no, there's a limited amount of parking around it and that, that parking that is close is expensive. And so as we redevelop that structure or find a new home, we need to make sure that there's more parking at a lower cost for the people who have to go to the Justice Center. Okay. Discuss county support of public transit. How can it become more responsive to the needs of riders? 
Well, first of all, we do need the federal and state government to be much more supportive and aggressive in providing funding for transportation. Excuse me. As my former colleague, friend, and baby sister said, uh, people who um, come from lower income brackets need public transportation as a backup system to their own vehicles. Uh, even those of us who are middle class or wealthy sometimes have a car that just isn't working right on any given day. Winter in Ohio can freeze um, a battery, or you can end up with tires that are underinflated. And so you, you probably decide you don't want to drive because it's icy, and maybe it would be better to catch the bus or the rapid. Um, so though that's the kind of investment that is good for all of us, and it's environmentally sound. So having proactive policies that allow additional investment from third parties, like the, the county, the state, and the federal government, is in all of our best interest. In addition, you can't just say that people should uh, drive their own car. We know that uh, there's additional pollution that comes from all of us having our own individual vehicles. And the better our transportation routes are, the easier it is for those of us who just drive to work and back home to do communal transportation. And so I would be supportive in trying to figure out new ways to do that. Oh, and wait a minute, the state took away oh, 30 to 40 percent of the funding that they used to provide to uh, public transportation. So it, there's a mandate to figure out how to fix this. Okay, thank you. Now this is a two-part question, um, and both are related to each other. Uh, the first part is, are you in favor of greater regionalization of services, and which ones? And if so, how can county council better promote regional cooperation? Yes, I support a regionalization of a series of services. And as an example, here in Cleveland Heights, we worked with four other communities to regionalize our dispatch center. And I was very proud of the work that our staff and council uh, jointly did. I see my colleague, uh, Mary Dunbar, in the audience. Um, we were aggressive in finding out ways to work together to create the joint dispatch. So clearly, I believe that fire, police, um, some of our safety services can be done jointly. Uh, over the years, Cleveland Heights has uh, worked with university students to pick up uh, debris, our trash. Um, we uh, realize that in some ways that might be another uh, step in forward in regionalization. Uh, currently, uh, um, leadership at, in, the, in the administrative, uh, the, I'm sorry, the executive, I'm showing my age now, and the executive of Cuyahoga County, um, has a, a staff person who's committed to regional ideas and working on those ideas. Uh, and they have supported the, the fire and safety dispatch centers with funding and not just the service. And I was pretty pleased with that over the last couple of years. So I think there should be more money set aside to do that. And the result is uh, less money spent by the individual communities when we combine our endeavors and efforts. What should the county executive focus on over the next four years, in your opinion? It's important. Um, currently, because of what we're seeing in the media, uh, it's important to focus on um, having a clean operation where uh, pay raises and job descriptions and benefits comply with the county handbook that was approved by county council rather than uh, saying, here's our handbook, but I'm going to pay these people something different. We have to, we have to lead if we're elected officials and we want businesses to operate correctly. We can't tell businesses that they should um, pay men and women the same, and we don't do it at government level, and we don't protect people's um, uh, benefits packages, and. We don't put right handbooks that are clear and transparent. So I think that the first thing is to clean up house, make sure that it operates fairly and consistently with the law. The second is to be more aggressive with housing and economic development, because that's how we, the beauty of housing and economic development is when we invest in those kinds of, of uh, business
business ventures and housing ventures that um, create jobs. For example, with new construction of housing, because this is a state where prevailing wage for housing is incredibly important, we have job creation that pays more than a living wage because even the laborers who are cleaning up sites make $15 to $19 an hour. Then we have homes where equity is increased every time you pay your mortgage and you can help your kids go to college, you can help your parents in their senior years, or if you're an entrepreneur, you can help grow your business with equity from your home. So we should find ways to create jobs and housing that will help us reinvest in our marketplace. Okay. How has our current administration affected local governments both positively and negatively? I think that our current county administration, mm -hmm. I think that our current county executive is a very nice guy and he's gone out of his way to, to build relationships with a lot of people uh, on both sides of the party. He does get the bipartisan effort. So his personal style um, has been welcoming and engaging. So that has to be at least 10 bonus points. Um, because you can have leaders who are not affable or user friendly in their interactions with communities. Um, I think that uh, we have not been as aggressive in finding ways to make ourselves more self sufficient and grow. Uh, our population base is declining, and uh, we need to find a way to attract more people here uh, to reduce the brain drain. Uh, the intellectual, the people that come to get educated here and then leave, we need to lower the numbers of people who leave um, and attract more people here. And that is the direction I think we should head in as we move toward the future. Okay. And here's a question, and I'm really not, I'm not aware of this, but I'll ask it. Are you in favor of the Cuyahoga County Charter Amendments on the November 6th ballot? I don't remember what the I don't either, were. and I'm not sure what the question is, but I'm asking the question. So I can't, I, you know, I don't, I, I read them, and they're, like, not there, so I can't okay, answer. Okay, that's fine. Um, and please discuss your ideas about job creation in Cuyahoga County, and this is our last question. So I would love to see the county issue a bond that would allow um, the Cuyahoga County Department of Development to be more aggressive in its lending to mid and small size businesses as well as some of the larger businesses. Uh, there's an entity called Jumpstart that looks at intellectually engaging um, with technology based businesses, with healthcare based businesses. I'd like to see us lending million dollar increments to businesses that have an aggressive growth and job creation plan. And then with some portion of it, if you know, currently the interest rates are really low on some of these bonds. Uh, they're between two and three and a half percent, depending on uh, you know where what your bond rating is. And so if we were to do things like that, it would allow us to be much more aggressive in um, financing things that have to go out west for financing, um, and they can, they can create products in this marketplace. Um, one of the things I did uh, uh, along the way was to consult private businesses who needed to do economic development financing. And one of my uh, prior clients was a company by the name of Nottingham Spurk, and they focus on uh, intellectual ideas. And the average wage in their company is $75,000. They're located on the edge of Cleveland Heights and Cleveland. And my role was to help them finance. The, uh, the rehab of the church facility uh, that there is now their home offices. And the reality is that when you help entrepreneurs who do nothing but think of new ideas all the time, they have, you know, like 250 patents, you're helping the community always think of new ideas. And that's what I want Cuyahoga County to begin to do. Always think of new ideas to enrich itself and its residents and grow its population and stabilize its income. Okay. Well, thank you very much for being here tonight.